let's get into like the sticky and talk about vaccines. Oh, we're going to go there. We have to go there. <laughs> I think we have to go there. There's too much about it. There's too much, there's too much curiosity. There's too much awareness coming out about it. You know, one of my colleagues and good friends in the medical field is Dr. Robert Sears. He is two exits down the freeway from me. You know, we're really close in proximity and really close uh, as spiritual companions through this life. And he said it best recently, and he's always in trouble. So, you know, I, I, I do try to avoid topics that are like, you know, the hot topic because yeah. There's there's persecution, you know, like like one of the things I want to talk about is like the the burning of witches, and it's like no, this this is still the burning of witches here, and so mm. we we share a lot of common clients. I call them clients. Some people will call them patients. And what he said is that um, in his practice, he's been practicing pediatrics for 25 years. He has released a book called the Vaccine Book. He's done a lot of research, um, and. He has a client base where th when he started, the majority of his clients were questioning some, you know, vaccine choices. Um, and and then as his practice evolved, everybody kind of saw him as the the pediatrician that would accept them. You know, a lot of pediatricians, if they're controlled by the insurance companies, will say, hey, we can't see you in our office. Like you need to find another pediatrician. And so he was the pediatrician with open doors that said, you know, I'm here to welcome you with the choices that you're making for your children as a responsible adult making autonomous choices based in best benefits, risks, and alternatives. And here are those benefits, risks, and alternatives. And what he found is that most people de you know, decided not to um, adhere to the CDC you know, it's different. There's, it's, it's, it's always changing, but the recommendations that change every year. And what he saw is that in a practice that should have had a lot of children that were really sick from diseases that we're vaccinating from, were, were children that were actually really, really healthy. And if they did contract some of these, you know, pertussis, whooping cough type things that their immune systems were able to support them in a way where they, yeah, they got sick, but they, none of them had died. So statistically speaking, it doesn't really line up. And so, he, you know, he, what he also has seen on the contrary is people that have come to him because of injuries that had been had and he's watched those children recover. And then parents make choices outside of what mm. they did the first time because they had seen an injury and, you know, pivoted to not have the same experience for future, for future children. And so it's just one of those, um, things that if we, we look at the numbers with, you know, and granted it's a small pediatric practice, but it still is, it's, it's relevant and it, it's, yeah. you know, and, and like I said, we share these clients. And so, a lot of people choose home birth because they don't want to have the same experience that they had before, which could right. involve injured children. For someone, because it's got to be a personal decision, intuitive, do what feels right for you, go do your research. Like, where would you point, where would you point, what direction would you point people in to do that research to make that decision for themselves? Yes. So it's definitely a personal decision. And it's something that I always say, like, always, always, always use informed consent while making right. those decisions. Like it's right. not a one size fits all medicine in general is not one size fits all. It should always be individualized. Um, Bob is a really good place to start. So the vaccine book you can get on Amazon, um, him and one of my former clients, Melissa Floyd did a podcast called the vaccine conversation. Um, I think it's the vaccine conversation.org. I'll have to double check on it, but they have hours and hours and hours and hours of recorded, um, information. Um, specifically we could even talk about, we, there's a bill coming up in California that's going to require all 13 year old boys and girls to get the HPV vaccine to enter school. Oh, and so wow. they had a, a big, uh, conversation about the benefits, risks, and alternatives of the HPV vaccine. So there's just a lot of movement within that right now. And it's, it's really, you know, like it's, it's, it's pretty censored. Um, and so there's, you can definitely find information out there, but you have to, to look at the right places. So I, I, I would think the vaccine conversation podcast would be the perfect place to start. Mm -hmm. Did I hear something when I was listening to some things prepping about stillbirths and an increase in stillbirths in recent time? Mm -hmm. So the numbers aren't out 
all the way yet, but what we're starting to see is anywhere uh, up to an increase of stillbirths of 1700% since 2020. Nobody knows. I mean, people have their, their own conclusions, but there's nothing that has been, you know, in the medical community that says this is what's causing it. Also, last week, uh, we had our uh, release of information about maternal mortality. So there's infant mortality and maternal mortality. Oh, and maternal yeah. mortality went up 40% from 2020 to 2021. 40, 40 percent. There's a lot of um, medical racism, if you will. There's there's disparities within different communities that the you know the I think it's 42.8 per 100,000 women that die are black compared to 12.1 that are white. Um, don't quote me on those exact statistics, but I think that's what it is. Um, and there's so many different ways that we can look at this, but. 40% in one year. 1700%? Like, like are you are kidding crazy me? Crazy right numbers. Now? They're crazy in numbers. And, and you know, like our infant mortality rate, Cuba has a better infant mortality rate than the United States. What is going on? Is there really population control going on? Is there like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. Because I mean, it just seems things are not sensical. Like mm -hmm. these are incredibly scary statistics. I mean, you know, you hear, you know, Bill Gates say that we need population control. And then you hear Elon Musk say, we are running out of people. Like we, there's not enough people. Yeah. We're going to, we're, this is a problem. Yeah. And I can see it from that side because I mean, here I am, I'm 40. Like I'm not having children. Like women are having them later. People are generally having less kids. I think Yeah. there's men have, men are, have more erectile dysfunction, have mm -hmm. lower uh, fertility rates. I mean, um, I think the testosterone rate has dropped 70%. Yeah. So that, like I like mean, that's a significant, huge thing. There's yeah. a, a doctor that talks about the, the um, shrinking of the perineum. The taint is what it's known as. And every year that the space in between the, our, as women, our perineum in between our vagina and our anus. And then as men in between the testicles and their anus is shrinking every year. There's actually something called micro penises now. My yeah, pro penises. I like, haven't come across one, thank God, but you know. Well, it, but you know, I, I have in my practice. <laughs> like I, I had my ultrasound tech message me and be like, this penis is really small. And I was like, shut up. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And I mean, the baby came out with a micro penis. And this is a mom that takes really good care of herself. So where where is that coming from? You know, like, like is it the plastics? Is it the the phytoestrogens? Is it the glyphosate that's being sprayed all over every freaking thing. Even if you eat a organic, you know, it's in everything. Uh, the seed oils that we're like, what is it? What is it? You know, there's, it's a combination of all the things. Is it one thing? Who knows? Oh, before we get off of totally um, children, I, I thought I just wanted to ask about circumcision. One of the topics that I am most passionate about, actually, when I worked in the hospital, I had an office next to the newborn nursery. Uh -huh. And I remember the first day that I heard the scream of a newborn baby boy that was being circumcised. Mm. It is printed to the depth of my soul. I will never forget it. It still makes everything in my body, every, every ounce of my soul stand up and say that I will always be the voice of newborn baby boys that don't have a voice. So let's look at world circumcision rates, right? We are, we are barely anybody circumcised in the world. Like we're at 80% of the world that's not circumcised. Okay. You're 40, I'm 41. When we were growing up, right? Everybody was circumcised. There, yeah. there was, I mean, and if you had like one friend, I had, you know, a friend, John, who was from Argentina, he wasn't circumcised and everybody yeah, knew. Everybody in America for sure. Yeah. Everybody knew that there was I one. I had a friend who had a baby and she, you know, the other day she came home a couple of weeks ago and. Because he got circumcised that day, and you yeah, know. yeah. So now in the United States, that's that's as a whole, the United States has dropped under fifty percent for circumcision. Um, in the Western states, in the Western states, we're right around twenty percent um, because a lot of insurance companies are not covering it because it's now being dubbed a cosmetic procedure because it is okay. So there is no medical benefit. The American Academy of Pediatrics sticks their head in the sand. They actually posted a graphic when they released their circumcision statement probably 15 years ago, and it was a bird with its head in the sand. Okay. Stop it. Yeah. So what we know is that Dr. Kellogg, 
Kellogg's cereal brought circumcision to the United States back in the late 1800s. And a lot of and fucking sugar for breakfast. Well, yeah, among a mil- million other things, right? And what he said is that this there is this puritanical belief system that if we circumcise boys, they wouldn't masturbate. Back then, they thought that masturbation led to insanity. Okay. So the basis, I mean, I know there's religious reasons. I get that. Like, I'm not not talking about that. Okay. The basis of westernized medical circumcision is based on the assumption of Dr. Kellogg, who told us that guys wouldn't masturbate. Now, we know that's not fucking true, right? Like, come on. Like, they're not. We're not talking about Kellogg's cereal, are we? Yeah. Dr. Oh, Kellogg. We are. Okay. Yeah, okay. I yeah. was like, wait a second. I heard Kellogg and I just want to yeah. make sure. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Kellogg brought this information in. Now, we could go into the spirituality of this, right? If we are to take a newborn baby boy out of the arms of a brand new mother and take it somewhere and cut off the most sensitive part of its body, right there, you have just dubbed control of that mother and her parenting relationship, right? Mm. Like, like, let that sink in. Mm. Like, like, it is so unmaternal to let anybody harm your baby. Yeah. But to have a medical professional come in and say that you have to to do this and cut off the most sensitive part of its body, that right there asserts control within the medical system immediately. If you like this clip and you want to hear the whole episode, click at the bottom of your screen. <laughs>